Welcome back to First Baptist Church of Hammond. Thank you very much. It's a great honor, and uh, thank you for inviting me again. Tell us about where you grew up, your city, and just what it was like being a little boy growing up in the Middle East. Yes, as you saw in the Fox uh, documentary, this was uh, uh, the first uh, documentary uh, was uh, on a national TV, American national TV about uh, two years ago. Uh, what you see, throwing stones, shooting, uh, death, this is a small portion of what we witnessed for as a Palestinian uh, child. Um, uh, it's not the best environment for a child to grow up. Um, we witnessed lots of violence, persecution, abuse of power, corruption, uh, lying, um, totally wrong belief systems, and lots of pain, not only because of occupation or killing and shooting. People inside, they are uh, sad. They have lots of sorrow because I think they are lost souls. That's a good point. What, what, uh, what city did you grow up in, Masab? I grew up in Ramallah. And in where the is West that? Bank. Where would these young people, how would they identify that on a map, for instance? Yes. Um, Ramallah is a very important part of the uh, Holy Land. And uh, Ramallah, there is an area uh, called Beit Il in the Bible. This is Ramallah where Jacob uh, had his tent. My house is just one mile from there. And uh, this is the area where our Lord was uh, born. If you look at the map, you are going to find that this is the heart of the world. Many times I ask myself, why did God choose this place uh, among all other places? Because it is the heart of our planet. It's right in the middle. And I don't think that God, our Lord, just said, let's jump and see where I land. <laughs> you know, I think he chose that place to be born That's a good for point. a reason. That's great. So near Bethlehem and uh, that area, um, your family, brothers and sisters? Yes. How many do you have? Uh, I have five brothers and three sisters. And uh, are you the youngest or the oldest? I am the oldest. The oldest. And uh, have you been in touch at all with your brothers and sisters in the last few years? Um, after my conversion, uh, everything was uh, okay. We kept uh, on talking, but uh, when I revealed my relationship with the Israeli intelligence, and uh, they figured out that uh, I uh, put many of the terrorist leaders in prison, mm. Uh, my father had no option but to disown me, and mm. since then we've been not uh, in touch. My, 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 I'm so sorry. As a little boy growing up in Ramallah, uh, did you play any sports or what was school like? Just what was the uh, family life or the little boy's life like growing up in, in that city? Well, since we didn't have uh, playgrounds, I had a, we had this uh, empty space in the cemetery. Mm. And we used to gather with, the, with friends and play some soccer, you know, mm. and uh, that's, uh, that was a sport that... Are you good? Used. Are you good at soccer? Not bad. <laughs> <laughs> good. We've got our soccer coaches here, and they're, they're looking for good Sometimes players. Sometimes when, when I play soccer here, they tell me, you're, you're kind of fast. I tell them, I'm not fast because I used to play soccer when I was a child, because I was running from settlers shooting at me. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that will make you pretty fast. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, tell us about... Uh, uh, Israel being right there next door neighbor. Why is such a tension between uh, Palestine and Israel? What's, what's the friction there? You know, this is, uh, when we read the Bible, this is a long uh, uh, conflict uh, between uh, Isaac and Ishmael yes. since day uh, one. And the uh, Palestinians are the sons of Ishmael. Mm. Mm. Uh, Jews are the sons of uh, Isaac. And uh, today, if seculars want to ignore this fact, you know, they can say whatever they want to say, but this conflict has its roots dig deep in history and in that region. Uh, 3,000 years ago, Palestinians used to live on the coastal area, and uh, Israelis used to live on the mountains area, or the West Bank. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, Palestinians live on the mountains, and the Israelis live on the uh, uh, coastal area. Yes, yes. And uh, 
each side claim that this is our land, this is our holy uh, land that they don't want to give it to the others. And they both claim Abraham as their ancestor. Yes, uh, but you know, uh, Palestinians see it in a different way, see it in the Islamic vision, <laughs> and uh, the Israelis see it in the Bible, in the biblical uh, vision. Yeah. So this is uh, the, the difference. In fact, uh, Muslims say that Ishmael, uh, Abraham was uh, the one uh, who, who wanted to sacrifice his son Ishmael, not Isaac. Really? And they argue about this, and uh, it's totally baseless. Interesting. So the Israelis, of course, they don't uh, claim Christ as their uh, religion or savior, and the Palestinians don't. What's the difference in religion between the two, uh, Israel and Palestine? Um, I think you mentioned well, Palestinians are Muslim. Yes. And the Israelis majority, are not. Yes, majority are Muslims. And uh, all I can say at this uh, point, I know this is politically incorrect. And uh, I have been uh, paying a very high price. And when you see the fight of governments, uh, terrorist groups, uh, all type of uh, seculars, atheists, mm -hmm. uh, even some Christians today, because they consider me as politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. Why? Because I say that the religion of my people is a fake religion. Mm -hmm. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. The God of Islam is a liar. Mm. And he calls himself the deceit. Mm. In the Quran, he calls wow. himself the deceit and people worship him every day. That's amazing. That's unbelievable. And so this is, this is why I say it's a lie. Because Muhammad simply, you know, came with a lie. He said, I am a prophet from God. And this is the personality of your God and worship him. Now people start to worship him 1400 years ago. Mm -hmm. Now when we go to the Bible, which is much older than the Qur'an, and we judge what's in the Qur'an, or what's in the Bible, uh, we will figure out that this is not more than satanic uh, religion. Hmm. And uh, um, I know this is, this is kind of uh, dangerous. I hope that I'm not offending uh, anybody, and uh, I am not just claiming this. Uh, I, have, I have studied Islam. My family started the Islamic Revolution in the Middle East, mm. and uh, that was our business. This is still my, my family's business. We started right. everything. Mm. And uh, after uh, uh, almost 20 years in Islam, I tell you that Islam is going nowhere. Mm. And I know that my family, my people are suffering the most because of this false teaching. So this is, uh, uh, when we think about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we need to understand the ideological dimension of this conflict. Without understanding that, we won't be able to understand the depth of the conflict and we'll keep saying why, why people don't come along. Masab, do the Muslims, or the Palestinians in your case, do, do, they, do they read the Quran? I mean, they all claim it as their Bible, we would call it. Do they read it like uh, Christians are supposed to read their Bibles? Um, they read the Quran, but unfortunately they don't understand it. When we think about the Muslim situation today, we need to remember all the time the Dark Ages before William Tyndale and uh, Martin Luther uh, translated the Bible from Greek to other languages. Excuse me. Um, people read the Quran, but they don't understand it because it's in the classic Arabic that used to... Uh, um, uh, be the main language 1400 years ago. They can read it, but they don't understand it, and they focus on the chanting, they th focus on the uh, religious part of Islam, and they don't uh, uh, understand the ideology, the spiritual uh, uh, side of, of Islam, and they end up just blinded, and they think this is, we worship God Almighty, and uh, uh, Mo uh, Prophet Muhammad is the last prophet, so we obey and uh, we uh, worship the creator of the universe without even understanding the personality of the prophet and uh, their uh, creator that they supposedly worshiping. But the, the problem, uh, back to Muhammad, when we say prophet Muhammad, please to remember this, this guy claimed that he's a prophet and it seems that he forgot to tell his people the prophecy. The guy doesn't have prophecy. If you ask any Muslim, what's the prophecy of Muhammad? He doesn't have a prophecy. So why do you call yourself a prophet if you don't have a prophecy? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> and, you know, this is, 
This is just something that I don't know. Muslims don't ask those Great questions question. because they are not allowed. And a prophet without a miracle. So to them, how can we know that this is a prophet from God without a miracle? And uh, uh, we figure out that he has a miracle. And the miracle was that he flew on a donkey from Mecca to Jerusalem. During the night when it was dark, and the donkey was the only witness. <laughs> so we, we tell them usually, you know, Jesus Christ, when he did a miracle, you know, to feed people of like a couple of fish and a uh, couple of bread, 5,000 people, 7,000 people witnessed that. Right. This is a miracle. Yes. You know that? Yes. But in, in Muhammad's case, he did it in the dark. <laughs> he and the donkey. <laughs> We're the only witnesses. I do a lot of miracles in the dark. It's called dreams while I'm sleeping. <laughs> That's great. Let me go back to your family, if I could, Musab. Yeah. Your father. Tell us about your dad and uh, your father and, and uh, what his role in, in this revolution and also your relationship with your father, please. Yes, my father is the most sincere man I ever met or known in my life. And uh, I'm not trying to praise him because he's my father. Uh, I know his humility how much he sacrificed for his people, and he ref reflects really the good side of the Muslim world. Uh, he did his best, and uh, for example, he's a very loving person, but he never uh, adopted in his heart the unconditional love. He loves his people, he loves his family, he loves uh, people uh, uh, of his nation, um, but uh, the, the question, like, will he be able to love everybody unconditionally, other nations, you know, the Jews, uh, Christians? And he never got the chance to uh, uh, hold himself to those high standards. He's a wonderful person. Um, uh, uh, he used to help us in the house. He's a very good father. Uh, he sacrificed a lot for us as children. And uh, I admire his uh, humility, in fact. Uh, this is the most important thing about his uh, personality. But all this is not enough, yeah, yeah. is not enough, and I am expecting from him to uh, open his eyes since he loves God, since he worships him, and he's not hypocrite about it, by the way. He's looking for God in, in his life. He never get the chance to know him, and I invited him to come and know Jesus Christ. Yes. Uh, I was very firm and clear about this, and I'm sure that because he understands that I studied this and I had very difficult questions that he couldn't answer. I'm sure that he's questioning today if he's on the right path or not because he doesn't care a lot about this worldly life. He cares about the other life. But it, it, it gives me some hope. I, I, I still believe that there is a chance to bring him, to bring our people in the Middle East uh, to uh, the freedom and liberty of Jesus Christ. Mm. You're that's a, an amazing story there. Your father, his title is Sheikh. Would you tell us what a Sheikh is and what that means to Americans? Yes. Um, you know, many people can claim that they are Sheikhs, uh, like uh, many people can claim that they are pastors yes. today. You know, they can go to a school, study for one year and come and we are... Uh, right, right. So my father is, uh, uh, is a Sheikh, but he's uh, one of the uh, uh, leaders and uh, uh, spiritual, in fact, leaders of the entire Muslim world, not only in the Middle East or in the Palestinian territories. He's a top leader of uh, a leading organization in the entire Muslim, the biggest in uh, organization in the Muslim world called the Muslim Brotherhood and the Hamas organization, its military wing. Um, so he has supporters here in the United States, everywhere, and... Uh, uh, so this is the uh, nature of uh, uh, my father being a sheikh. Yes. Um, he's a top Islamic uh, leader, and he's in a prison today. Because of that, you don't hear lots of things on the news. But tomorrow, when he's released, he will be talking with the name of Islam somewhere from Ramallah, from the West Bank, from Jerusalem, I don't know, uh, representing Islam. And I will be here in the West talking and representing Christianity and this type of dialogue that we will have as a dialogue between a son and a father, yes. we want to see how close we can get and uh, uh, um, shorten the gap uh, between uh, the West and the East, between Christianity and the others, um, and uh, between people in general. Yes. Your father's in 
prison right now. Yes. Is that correct? And yes. he's in, in an Israeli prison? Is yes. that correct? And uh, why is he in prison and for how long do you think he'll be in prison? Unfortunately, uh, I am very sorry to say that I was the person who uh, put my father in prison. And uh, during that time I was working for the Israeli intelligence undercover. And my father didn't know about uh, that uh, since he was uh, a top leader of a terrorist organization. He's not a terrorist himself by acting, you know, but he's given cover to uh, a terrorist organization. And uh, I was uh, working totally against his will, against the will of his organization, and uh, doing my best uh, to destroy that idea uh, of uh, violence. Uh, and uh, the best place, unfortunately, when I had the choice to choose where to put my father. If he's outside, he's going to be assassinated. And in prison, prison was the safest place that I can put my father in. And that was uh, five years ago. And since then, he has been in prison because of me. And uh, I told him this, you know, that you are in prison because I, I put you there. My, my, my. How long do you think your father will be in prison? He would be released, I think, uh, in uh, one year from now. Oh, amazing. And then you plan to meet with him and talk to him some more? Uh, as uh, some of you know, that he disowned me uh, publicly right. Right. Uh, about uh, six months ago, mm. the eve of the release of my book. Um, but I, I am hopeful that one day we will talk together and we will be together. I said this many times that what's between me and my father, what's between me and my, my people is the God of Islam. Mm. This wall. And if it takes to destroy this wall, to get back to my family, mm. I will do it. Mm. I will do it with the power of love, with the power of my God. It's very convicting, Masab. God bless you. That's amazing. Yes. <laughs> Let's uh, back up a little bit in your life. Um, here you are, a little boy playing soccer in the cemetery. Uh, something happens. Uh, um, how old were you when you began to look at the political scene or however you saw it, the revolution or whatever, and began to think that was a life for you as well? Were you 6, 7, 12, 13? How old were you when you began to really actively participate? I asked uh, myself many times, why are our people behind? We have human resources, we have uh, oil, uh, we have very smart people. Why, why we are not one of the best nations? And uh, the reason, of course, as my family taught me and as the uh, Islamic uh, modern doctrine talks that the West is responsible for that. Christianity is responsible for this, to put us under slavery, persecution, take everything that we have and leave us behind. And they're using their power, their weapons, everything. And this is a big lie. And I was con convicted that this is the reason why we are behind. Uh, so it was easy to blame Israel, to blame America, to blame the West in general, as everybody today in the Middle East, by the way. Blame you, blame me, blame the church, blame Israel, the United States government, even the God of the Bible for their misery, for their uh, bad life. And uh, I grew up in that environment. But this is the easy, the easiest answer to blame the others. Yes. And I start to learn, figure out maybe we have other problems and this didn't come uh, out of comfort. Uh, this came after persecution, after torture, after lots of pain. Not only because of the Israelis, because also of my people. And I suffered a lot uh, as a child to see all the blood, all the persecution, now you were the involved madness. in that. It mentioned you throwing rocks at tanks. Yes. That's true. You, you, you physically, in that sense, fought against the Israeli army. I was part of that, and I was even much uh, uh, more involved uh, in that to a level that I, want, I, I bought guns. I wanted to go and shoot, kill Israelis. Wow. Um, so you grew up with a real hatred for the Israelis, blaming them for... When you're living in the Middle East, you have several reasons to hate Israel. You have ideological reasons, you have political reasons. 
Israel is viewed as occupying force in that region. Mm -hmm. And by the way, uh, it's recognized by most international uh, community uh, governments that it's occupying force. Mm -hmm. um, so when somebody is occupying your land, you hate them for, for that. Yes. So this is the political reason. Right. Secondly, the ideological reason that the God of Islam doesn't like Jews. Muhammad doesn't like Jews. Yeah. Uh, he described them as uh, pigs and uh, monkeys. So uh, Muhammad described the Jews as pigs and monkeys. Ex exactly. Interesting. And uh, you know, Muhammad himself. This is why all the time I need. I, I like to get back to the root of the problem. Muhammad is the highest example for Muslims. He's the model for all uh, Muslims here in America and in the Middle East, and uh, they follow his steps. Now, Muhammad himself killed Jews, Christians, and anybody who didn't believe in his message. Uh, he raped Jewish woman after killing her uh, husband, uh, father, and uncle. The same day, he slept with her, and she became one of his wives later on. His, her name is Safiya. Uh, a Jew. A Jew. Mm -hmm. One of his... Uh, uh, more than 50 wives. Officially, he has only 16. But any woman in the Quran that offered herself for the Prophet, again to the Prophet point, uh, he has the right to say yes or no. And he has more than 50 wives. So Muhammad is the highest example for Muslims. And if he hated Jews, if he killed Jews, Muslims don't have only political reasons to hate and kill Jews. They have ideological reasons. They worship God. They worship their God, the God of the Quran, by killing Jews. Mm. So um, this is the type of uh, uh, environment, you know, where you, you grow up. You have ideological reasons, political reasons. You have enough reasons. What would happen if you grow up in that environment? Like anybody of you guys, like ask yourself this question. If you grow up in that situation, will you be able to make it out? Um, and this was one of my questions to the judge. You know, you're judging me because I had affiliation uh, with uh, a terrorist, my father, that we were sitting on the same table and eating, you know, in the same room. That's my father. I grew up there. I was born there. Right. And I had no choice but to be affiliated with him. But I made my way out. If you were in my shoes, would you be able to make it out? Great question. Great question. How old were you, Masab, when you wound up going to prison? I was arrested the first time when I was 18 years uh, old. And the Israelis arrested you? They, were you arrested on the street or in your house? Uh, they came into my house uh, looking for me and uh, I uh, ran away. I told you I'm fast. <laughs> I know how to run. And uh, a month later uh, they arrested me um, and I was tortured brutally. In how fact. long were you in prison at that time? 16 months. 16 months. They tortured you? The Israelis? Yes, the Israeli tortured me for uh, about uh, three months uh, in uh, one of the uh, worst interrogation facilities. Was that the worst part of prison? What, what, what happened in prison besides the torture that, that affected you? I was already full of hate for uh, the Jews and I wanted to kill them. I, I bought guns. Because of that, I was arrested. Because I bought guns and uh, uh, they discovered my uh, plans before I... Uh, uh, put them in practice. Mm. So um, I was uh, arrested, tortured, because I didn't want to give information. I want to be the tough guy. And they don't, uh, they don't have uh, tolerance for anybody who wants to harm the state of Israel. And uh, I was tortured for that uh, reason. And uh, uh, during that time, after I was tortured, they offered me to work for them. And I said, you got to be kidding me. You're torturing me, arresting my father. My father is still in your prisons, and you're killing my people. You're shooting at me, and now you're offering me to work for you. And I thought that would be a great opportunity to fool them. To them, yes, I work for you. So while they feel safe toward me, I infiltrate them and take revenge from inside. So that was my goal, to play a double agent. And uh, we agreed to work together. They sent me to prison with other Hamas members to spend the rest of my uh, sentence. 
And during that time, I found Hamas torturing. When I say Hamas, this is the Islamic radical uh, uh, resistance movement that is responsible for the killing of thousands of Israelis that my father fa found it. Now, when I went to prison, I found those people who I was hoping that one day they will bring justice, happiness uh, to earth uh, by uh, creating a global Islamic state. They were torturing their own people. So well, I, why were they torturing their own people? Uh, they were sus uh, suspicious that uh, uh, some of the Hamas members gave information to the Israelis. Sure, sure. So they wanted to figure out who gave information. And uh, practically, while my intention wasn't to help Israel, I was in a relationship with the Israelis, but they didn't know about it. So now I had the chance to see how they were torturing people that they had nothing to do with the Israeli Shembet. Because at that time, I knew at least the basics of how Israel works and communicate with its people. And most people were tortured. They had no relationship with the Israeli Shembet. So they were victims. Shin, Shin Bet is their... The Israeli Intelligence Service. Intelligence Service, sort of like of our SC, FBI. FBI. Like okay. the FBI. Good. So the, they were torturing their own people without a mercy. You know, and it was much worse than the Israeli torture. What effect did that have on you watching your own people torturing your own people? Um, one important question in my life, in my uh, uh, mind started. Why do I hate Israel for torturing me and torturing my people, and I don't hate Hamas for torturing our, our people? Great question. Why only I hate Israel? Logically. And that was one of the first logical questions that I, I had in this long journey of getting out of the box of Islam and the Middle East and see the picture from outside and try to judge it uh, through the eyes of the Most High One, God Almighty. When you got out of prison 16 months later, um, had you, you're still uh, working for Israel as a spy. You had gone in thinking you were going to be a double agent, but when you got out, where did you stand? Whose side were you on, or where were you thinking at that point? Yeah, I went through a time of confusion. Imagine yourself sitting down and drinking coffee with people who, who wanted, you wanted to kill just you know, a few months ago. Uh, shaking the hands of people who arrested your father 16 times. Shaking the hands that you think it's hand, uh, they are hands with lots of blood, the blood of your people. And you're somehow, you love your people, and you know their sufferings. You know the tears of your mother, and you know how much she suffered because your dad was away. How hard for your soul, for everything, to sit down and shake hands with them. But now, you want to think logically, and you want to judge things, and it's just like the morals, the exact same morals that your dad taught you, now you want to implement them in your life. Why you're sitting even with your enemy? Because what your enemy is saying makes sense. In fact, not what my enemy is saying, so this looks like they brainwashed me. What my enemy was doing, it made more sense to me than what my closest people and family were doing. So during that time, I, I was really uh, uh, confused and I had a conflict between my morals and between my, uh, the reality that I'm living. And it was a very hard decision to keep into that relationship, but I became more curious to understand our problems. Why are we suffering? Why? Every day. Yes. There has to be uh, different answers than just blaming Israel and America for everything. Maybe we are the reason. Mm -hmm. And so during that time, I kept into a relationship to learn more. Then it became friendship. It became a real friendship with the people. The uh, exact people that I wanted to kill became my friends. Now, that was kind of crazy thing, even to think about it. And the, I had two options, to just ignore this reality and say, you know, I saw the truth. My enemy can be my friend. And maybe my best friend is my enemy. And if this is the reality of us as human beings, I want to turn my back and go hide somewhere, and I don't want to see any human being. No friend, no enemy. But I had to fight. Yeah. And 
this is where Jesus Christ came into my life. We're going to come back to that one in just a moment. I want to yes. start with that one. I want to ask you one final question in this session right here. You mentioned your mother and, of course, your family. Um, as a pastor, I, I, I'm thinking, how, I wonder how your mother took all this. Her husband's in prison. Her son, her eldest son is in prison. Uh, how's your mother handling? How, how'd she handle all that as a, as a mother with children? Was she radically involved with the Hamas movement, or is she just a good mama uh, at home taking care of the family? She's uh, a great uh, mother, and she's a, a, a warrior woman. In fact, what she has, when I say warrior, that she had the, the responsibility of nine children, and uh, while her husband was gone most of the time, and she was loyal to him, she was loyal to us, you know, working, trying her best to feed us, to teach us to do everything possible to make us the way that I am today. And I'm very grateful uh, for her. And uh, what really breaks my heart that I was very big uh, disappointment in her life, maybe the biggest and the worst challenge uh, for her life, you know, to see her son, that she, that I shared with her all the pain and uh, while my father was gone, I shared the responsibility of taking care of my uh, brothers and sisters. So to see just and think, did he forget all this? And what's the reason? Because now they're, ask, they're accusing me in the Middle East that I did everything for money. Mm. Or I was brainwashed. Maybe some people, you know, maybe I lost my mind. And this is why I'm saying this against Islam. So my mother says, no matter what the reason was, if it's money, if they uh, even did anything to him, um, he wouldn't forget the pain of our family. He grew up witnessing all our sufferings on a daily basis, the persecution of the occupation, the persecution even of our people, and the loneliness of my mother during all the, yes. those years to come down and tell her, you know, mother, thank you very much, and here is my gift. I'm going to make you look ridiculous in front of all your friends. I'm going to show you that all your efforts that you did, you know, trying to help us uh, were for nothing. And this is uh, uh, this feeling of uh, disappointing uh, your uh, parents. It's not an easy thing, but I believe that one day they will understand because to me, it's more than uh, uh, money and fame and anything like that. Uh, for me, this is the beginning of a process of changing the entire world. Mm. This is our world. It's our responsibility. And we are going to change it Amen. with the power of love. Masab, we left off the last uh, few moments when you said you felt that your enemies were your friends and your friends were your enemies. And you decided to get alone. And I'd like you to start there and expand a little bit. What do you mean by getting alone away from them? And uh, where did this journey take you? You had just left prison. Uh, you had been uh, hired by the Israeli secret agency to spy for them, initially to be a double agent. Saw the hypocrisy of your own Hamas fighters torturing their own. And then in the confusion and the thinking, I think you used the word, the logic of this all caused you to want to kind of step back. Expound on that a little bit, please. Yes. Um, for a person to wake up one day and uh, start to uh, realize the reality, um, it's very hard to wake up sometimes and figure out that you're living a lie. And maybe many of us, you know, rather to be in our comfortable zones always, in our little religious box, in our church, and we don't want to take any responsibility toward the world, or maybe in our own dreams, and uh, everybody lives his own kind of movie, you know, and everybody has his own understanding of God and the devil. And uh, I don't know if there are many people who get close to understand the Most High One. But when you start to realize that you're living a lie, 
your, your father that you believe that he's your daddy is not your daddy. Nobody wants to even think about this or go there because there are consequences always. And uh, in my case, it wasn't just to realize that my enemy is not really my enemy. The ones that I wanted to kill, those are not the enemies. The enemy is within, and the enemy can be also around me, people who I trust. And uh, the consequences for realizing this, feeling it, and living it for real, um, are deadly. You don't only lose, it's just like, oh, okay, this is right and this is wrong, let's do what's right and forget what's wrong. No, no, there is a high price if you want to do the right thing. And the right thing might look for the rest of the world that it's something wrong. But you know it's real and this is the truth. And if you decide to follow the truth, everybody's going to be against you. And uh, so during that time, it wasn't only confusion for a child or a young man. It was, it was very difficult decision to make on a daily basis and to pay a price that nobody can afford. Um, and uh, I took the risk. It was, uh, and still, very risky thing. Um, my life, as you see, I've been upside down almost and uh, how can a human being emotionally let's say emotionally uh, handle such a pressure um, but of course uh, without motivation without a high a higher power in your life you won't be able to make it uh, secularists ask me how do you wake up every day in the morning like Thinking about what? Thinking about terrorists hunting you, thinking about the government bureaucracy, thinking about almost everybody going against you, including Christians in the Middle East today, they call me Judas. Uh, some Christians in this country doubt my faith. Some Christians was like, um, are, is he for real or not? You know, they don't want even to believe that this is for real. And... Uh, so many, many enemies, and the devil is using the closest people who are supposed to support me during this time um, against me. So sometimes we'd be in a church. I, I was fired from the church because they didn't believe. That was before my public conversion when, every, when in the entire world it became a public story. When I shared this with the pastor and the congregation, they were like, um, you know, thank you, you know, uh, kindly, you know, if you... Stay out of the church for your safety. For your safety. Yeah, right, right. You know, they were really worried about me. And when I'm facing deportation to go and get killed, we pray for you, brother. Thank you very much for your prayers. Um, so I'm trying to say here, when I was back home, uh, we're going to get uh, back to your question, but when I was back home, I was Christian undercover. Uh, when I got baptized, I didn't tell anybody because the congregation that we had in Jerusalem, those young people like myself, if Hamas knew that those people converted me to Christianity, would kill all of them. My. For their safety, I didn't. For their safety, I didn't tell them I am a Christian. And I used to go to the church, being a disciple, one of them sit down and they somehow rejected me because in, air, in their eyes they were asking me every time what are you doing here you're not more than a son of a terrorist and i was like guys i'm one of you but i cannot tell you that and you have to see the rejection persecutions fr from the closest people to you and live with that and be strong not to give up because your focus is not christians and i didn't come to christianity because of christians Mm. No Christian get credit for this. Only God, only the Lord. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? So if any pastor, if any Christian come and claim and say, yes, I know this guy and uh, I had my blessings on him, say, no, you're not, you're not right. Because 
all the credit goes to the Lord. And he was my highest authority and he's still my highest authority. And he's my motivation. He's not only an idea that I have, he's everything in my life. And this didn't stop. You know, during that time when I start, I told you I was confused. Who's my enemy? Who's my friend? Right. And I'm reading the Bible and finding love your enemy. Is this an accident? This is not an accident. To tell us that story, how you got that Bible, and, and how did you, how did your life intersect with, with a believer? How in the world did a believer, because Israel isn't uh, Christianity, and Palestine, Palestinians aren't Christian. How did you, you do that in the Middle East? I was in Jerusalem visiting friends and uh, a cab driver from England. Maybe he doesn't know today about my story yet. He invited me to Bible study. He invited me in English, and I didn't even speak English at that time. I went to the Bible study, and uh, they gave me the Bible as a gift. Start to read the Bible, and uh, when I was reading the Sermon on the Mount, see the standards, the high standards of Jesus Christ, the great values that they are. Without them, we would destroy us a long time ago as human beings. Yes. And... Uh, when I was reading Love Your Enemy, that made perfect sense to me because I was confused who is my enemy all the time, mm -hmm. trying to look for an enemy to blame him for what was happening in my life and what was the, all the persecution against my people and the suffering of humankind in general. You were in a cab and a cab driver. I was walking downtown uh, uh, the old city of uh, Jerusalem and a cab driver was inviting people to a Bible study. Did you know it was a Bible study you were going to? No. I, they, when, when he asked me in English, I could understand that it was about Christianity. And because during that time I was in a relationship with Jews. Right. Okay. To us as Muslims, Jews are infidels. And I still learned a lot from the Jewish people. Right. So when I was invited by a Christian, I said, let's go and see what the other infidels have to say. You know, I learned some from infidels. It seems like the other infidels, what they have to say. So I went to the Bible study. This is why I went. I went out of curiosity. It wasn't that, oh yeah, let's go. I was, I went there kind of proud, you know. It's like, let's see what they have to say, you know. So I went there and, you know, they didn't say something great, but they could give me the Bible and it was that the right time. They had no idea who I was. Trust me, if they had an idea, they wouldn't invite me, first of all. <laughs> Second, if they knew when I was in the meeting, they would run out. <laughs> Nobody would stay in the room. Um, but thank God, six months later, they knew who I was, and they still were afraid. They, they gave you a just... Bible in Arabic. They gave me a Bible in Arabic and English. Uh -huh. It's uh, uh, in both languages, um, in the New Testament. Mm. Um, and uh, I was, it, what Jesus Christ taught on the mountain hmm. made a perfect sense to me. Your story, your story sounds like the Apostle Paul. No man claimed his salvation. God directly intervened. And the church had a hard time believing he was legitimate. It's an amazing parallel there. You received the Bible. And then uh, tell us a little more of the spiritual journey you went on from the time of the Bible study and receiving the Bible. Now I start to read the, the Bible, and uh, as, as all of us uh, know, there are some, some things in the Bible that we don't understand, especially that, uh, we are big, when we are beginners. And uh, there are some uh, violent verses, as some uh, seculars yes. say, and they try to compare it to the Quran, and uh, they are totally mistaken. They are totally mistaken. Uh, but still, um, I was fascinated about uh, Jesus Christ as a, as a teacher. I didn't adopt him as God. I said, this is a great teacher, but I cannot have him as God. It took me six years to study Christianity, to re-study Islam, to study Buddhism, to study Hindu, uh, Hinduism, to study most religions, in fact. And I'm a uh, major uh, of history. I graduated from uh, Jerusalem school. And uh, it was part of my studying. And I said, you know, I was born as a Muslim. This is not enough. Uh, why I supposed to be, what if I was born in a Jewish family? I would be a Jew today. 
So this is not enough just to be born in that. I want to use my mind and try to find the real God. But it was a very difficult thing to do. Because I told you, what if I discover a different God than mine? Mm. Will I be able to pay the price for that or not? And, uh, but as I told you, I took the risks of, the, uh, of this uh, journey. And uh, uh, it wa I saw Jesus Christ as a great teacher at the beginning. Uh, and later on, I uh, adopted him as my go God, Lord, and Savior. Um, but what I wanted to say through, this is a long process. Some people would come here and sit down, guys, and tell you, I saw God in a dream, and he changed my life. You know, I, I believe that God do miracles. I'm not saying that he doesn't. Yes, he does. But what happened in my life, it was a whole process that I think everybody should look carefully, especially Muslims and Christians, um, about what really was happening. Because God is very patient, and he's still very patient with me till this moment. Uh, he doesn't force himself on anybody. He gives you the choice, and if you choose, if you believe, and I'm not talking that you believe in religion or believe in a church or even believe in a pastor. Yes, those great leaders inspire us, but our main focus is on the Lord always. Amen. Amen. Um, but during, during that time, I was involved in the heart of Hamas. I was born in the heart of Hamas, the Islamic project, and I was in the heart of the Israeli Shimbet. I was in every meeting almost that uh, organized the so-called Palestinian Intifada. It's not about throwing stones only. It's For these teenagers, could you explain Intifada, what, what you mean Intifada by that? Intifada is uprising. This is the Palestinian vision of resistance to destroy Israel and India in the occupation. It started with stones and it ended up with suicide bombers on a daily basis. Do they believe they're actually going to be victorious? Yes, and this is the problem. Muslims have a great zeal to God. You know, they think that they believe in God Almighty. So they have the God motivation that they believe if they go blow themselves up and kill a thousand Jew or even infidel, it can be a Christian, it can be this congregation, it can be anywhere in the world that is outside of the body of Islam, to them, they're going to heaven. And they're having the 72 versions, and they're having all type of fun and their crazy fantasy of the other life. So yes, this is a promise of their God, and they do uh, uh, believe in it. So they're not just criminals. If we are facing criminals, we will be able to solve the problem. We are facing fanatics who believe in what they're doing, and they do it with the name of their highest authority, the God of Islam. This is the root of the problem. This is why my focus is against the ideology. It's not against the people. Well, because Sam, I still have hope in the people. We often hear in the States here that there's this uh, wonderful uh, group of people who are kind, loving, sweet, uh, Islamic communities. But it's just this relatively small, little fanatical group called the uh, extremist mm -hmm. Islamic. Is there really the, the dichotomy there? I mean, are this? Yes. Explain that, please. Yeah. I don't uh, differentiate between uh, radical and uh, moderate Muslim. Mm. I think moderate Muslim is more dangerous than uh, fanatic uh, Muslim. Mm. You know why? Because they give cover to the radicals. Some of them know, some of them don't know. And oh, either they are deceived or deceivers, and some of them are deceived and deceivers at the same time. They're all victims. Moderate Muslim who thinks that he's, uh, he feels uh, self-righteous, that I'm a better than this fanatic, I tell him, no, guess what? That you are more dangerous than the fanatic because you're given a cover to the fanatic by saying that Islam is a religion of peace. And also, you're self-righteous and you think that you are right. And you're absolutely wrong. So, uh, yes, I have a big problem with moderate Muslims, and my problem with them even is bigger than with fanatics. I fought terrorism for 10 years. I put m some of the most dangerous killers that maybe humanity have known. 
Some of them killed hundreds of people, hundreds. And uh, this is not the way. After 10 years of fighting terrorism, I understand that we were fighting a ghost. We need to fight their ideology. We need to fight their fake God, their fake prophet. And no power on earth can fight ideology. No government. Only you can fight ideology with other ideology. You cannot fight God with your muscles. I cannot go flex my muscles and tell Muslims, I'm going to defeat your God. No, it doesn't work like this. I go <laughs> Which to is Muslims. what America is partly doing. Yes, and they, if they keep like this, they will get defeated. That's what I can say, and this is how I see it. Um, but what I can say, if we want to fight God, we fight him with a God. And today when I fight the God of Islam, that he represents hate, revenge, I fight him only with one God that represents pure, unconditional love to all humankind. Ah, wonderful. Amen, amen. <laughs> Practically, how, how did we do this? And why, and by, by the way, when any seculars come and start to tell me you're politically incorrect and they start to judge, I tell them, if you have 5% of my experience, please come forward and talk about it. In Islam, I was one of the best Muslims. In the Shambat, I was one of the best Asians. For the government, I've had praise from the prime minister to everybody down, like from the Knesset, from everywhere all the time. They were wondering, who is this guy who's doing all this, those miracles? And I, I did every stage of my life the best. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying that here I'm dreaming or saying uh, dreams. I have experience. When I talk, I think I have the authority to say this against Islam because I know the nature of Islam. And when I talk about the best way of fighting terrorism, because I developed methods of defeating terrorism. And I'm sure that I went far into fighting terrorism to understand that we cannot defeat it if we don't defeat its ideology. And in order to defeat its ideology, you cannot go there and try to be politically correct. I don't care about all those nice you know, clothing people in New York here and there. I understand, okay, educated and... Uh, uh, smart people. But I say, if we don't fight the ideology, they're going to keep coming. If somebody can be creative to make a bomb of underwear and get on airplane, right. how can you defeat this type of mentality? Yeah. If you don't defeat them in the mind first, they will keep coming. They will send tomatoes like bombs. Yeah. Somebody eating a tomato and bam, it's exploding. <laughs> You know, they I'm not can, eating any more tomatoes. <laughs> yeah. No, what I'm saying, they can be creative, yes. more creative, and uh, the, the best way, we need to go to their minds, to their areas. We don't wait for them to come here and destroy us. We go to them and thank God for technology, for, uh, for information revolution, that we can outreach everybody everywhere. So now, this is not the time for... America to come and criticize what we are saying. They need, please, we ask them just to listen for a second. Stop saying that Islam is like any other religion. Yes, religions are all the same. I believe. I believe in that. But there is a difference between ideology based on love and ideology based on hate. We tell, they come and tell us there is no difference between the God of Islam and the God of Christianity. I tell them, no. Let's, we know the God of Christianity through the person of Jesus Christ. Our God was crucified, tortured in pain, and he was praying and forgiving his followers, uh, his torturers. And this is our highest example. Yes. In the Muslim case, we ask them, let's characterize the, the, the God of Islam. Let's put him into a person, into flesh, if you dare. And let's see how he's going to act. I suggested, let's make a movie for Muhammad coming on in 2015. How he's going to act in our world and see the real face of Islam. Why deceiving people? And 
so this is why I know what I'm saying is very sensitive. But uh, I, we're not going to stop. Because the best way, we have to say the truth. Uh, yes, with love. This doesn't mean that we, I'm provoking uh, violence. Uh, this is not my goal. It's not incitement. I am not here to say those words. So I make uh, some uh, uh, fundamentalists uh, in this country happy and feeling like victorious against Muslims. I still this and I say it. My audience and my main goal to talk to my people. Amen. Those words are for my dad, those words for my mother, for my people, for Palestinians, for Muslims, everywhere they are, in this country or in the Middle East. Those, because I love them, I need to tell them the truth. Yes. They suffer because of their God. Imagine that I was looking for an enemy all the time while I was worshipping my enemy five times a day. How crazy is this? You worship your enemy every day five times. You woke up at 4 a.m. in the morning to worship your biggest enemy, your God. This is how dangerous that enemy is. And he makes you think about everything else as enemy. And you're not thinking about him. And you're worshiping him. This is how dangerous and this is how sensitive. And when you are in a situation like this, there is no compromise. Yes, this sounds radical. I am not a radical person. I am very open-minded. I'm not even religious. And I, but I know what I'm saying is the truth. Mm. And I want to say it no matter what. If, even if everybody wants to fight me. You know, I, was, I wasn't surprised when I saw the U.S. government standing side by side with, with terrorists by fighting me. Terrorists want to kill me and the U.S. government want to deport me back to them. I wasn't shocked. I hope that this, this was a bureaucratic uh, problem. But um, if, if you let me go back to the, uh, uh, to the book, and please, if you have any question, uh, please do interrupt me. Um, in that situation, when I start to adopt the teachings of Jesus Christ, based, I, based on loving our enemies, and I was already in a relationship with my enemy, Jesus Christ simply was telling me, your enemy is not man. This is, what he, this is his message through love your enemy. That even you might see your brother, your friend, your neighbor as uh, they are your enemies, but in fact, they are not your enemies. And uh, I start to understand this philosophy, let's say, in, in my life and implement it in my life. But I wasn't in a situation that I could save many people's lives. I never counted. And I didn't mention any numbers in my book, but at least many suicide bombers could reach their targets, and we stopped them. It wasn't, by the way, by the power of the Israeli intelligence. All the time they were sitting there, huh? How did you get this information? <clears throat> I got it, you know, thank my God. And they would come with lots of rage, oh, let's go drop a bomb on them. No. I still cannot kill a terrorist. I am a Christian. This is how, like from a child who is full of hate that wanted to kill his enemies, to a person that he's even, he doesn't want to kill a terrorist. Somebody is about to go and kill dozens of people. I said, no, I am not even going to kill a terrorist. I remember once, and this is in the book, um, I knew about five side bombers in one house. Um, and uh, the Israeli Prime Minister decided to kill everything that breathes Hamas during that time. So they got the permission in half an hour to drop a bomb on that apartment and kill all the terrorists. The house was full of explosives, um, uh, explosive belts, and all types of weaponry. And uh, I said, no, I cannot do this. And uh, my Israeli Shembe, the FBI, told me, are you out of your mind? Well, what do you want to do? Like, those guys would carry their attacks in less than 48 hours. We have to stop them. And they're behind the enemy lines. I told them, that we go arrest them. I said, how can we go arrest a side bomber? Those guys, they can detonate uh, their uh, explosives and kill all the troops. And we will cause international crisis because nobody wants Israel to go to the Palestinian territories. I said, okay, then you kill them, I'm out of the game. I don't, 
I'm not going to participate in this and I will never work for you again. And because they were a need for, for me, you know, and they, uh, my uh, Shinbet handler was very uh, uh, convicted of my uh, vision of seeing things, that we don't stop violence by causing more violence. Let's stop violence with wisdom. Let's take a deep breath and think carefully about the best method of stopping violence mm. before we just go and let's use our power and we are causing more damage. Creating, uh, trying to uh, create a solution but we create a much bigger problem yes. with every solution that we make. And this is the, situa the uh, situation of humanity today here in this country. We have a problem, let's create a solution, then we figure out later on that the solution that we created was only a bigger problem. Yes. yes. So, um, and this wasn't because I was a very smart person. That's why I'm saying that the God, uh, uh, Jesus Christ, is the only one who gets the credit. Because I know for sure that without his wisdom, without his love, forgiveness, I wouldn't figure this out on my own. And today people can call me just whatever they want to call me, accuse me. I might lose lots of opportunities. Many seculars would look at me and say, hey, you could get lots, a much better publisher, you know, so I can write like a spy novel about, uh, you know, your journey and things like this. But I know for sure that then I will be betraying my Lord because my Lord, he's my inspiration. Yes. He's my teacher. He was the one step by step during all this uh, difficult uh, journey. Yes. Um, and, uh, but as you see, practically, as a Christian, no, how many people, did you think that I had uh, 50 pastors to go and uh, fellowship and uh, at some churches, hey guys, let's sit down and talk. I have uh, five side bombers, they want to kill like 100 Israelis like in the next uh, 24 hours. Let's uh, try to do something. What, what should I do? Counsel, they call it here. I was on my own with my God. I couldn't share this with any Christian. Right, right. I couldn't share it with anybody. I was Christian undercover. And I was rejected by the church. And I was totally on my own. If anybody discovered about my relationship with the Israelis, my relationship to Christ, anything, I would be killed without a question. So when you're in a situation like this, you need totally to rely on God. Yes, yes. And tell him, he shows what's the best. Let's go to the Bible and read and see what's the best in this condition. There is no justification for killing even a terrorist. Then it's over. I cannot do it. I don't care if the prime minister says, I'm sorry, I respect you, but I'm not going to obey you. I'm going to obey the one who created you. Mm. The most high one. And this is how I kept those signs, uh, marks in my life to lead me during this difficult, dark, scary journey for a young man. And I encourage all of you all the time, you know, I, 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 sometimes I feel, I don't feel comfortable when I see people like totally into religion and they have, you know, just uh, praise religion or praise church or I, I want you guys like to get out of the world. Our duty is much bigger than the religious box. Yes. We need to, sh if in order yes. to change this entire world, we need, everybody needs to be in their positions and when they are called, they have to answer. The way that the Lord likes it, not the way that the wor world like it. So uh, we carried many uh, sensitive operations. We saved many people's lives. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the Israeli government, the entire world, seculars, atheists, Christians, Muslims, they need to understand that one person gets the credit. Yes. One. God. God. Wonderful. You need to get the book. We're going to ask some more questions here, but we uh, initially uh, we asked how many books they could send, and they suggested 50. You bought those immediately before he even spoke. So we, we got a hold of 500 more since he spoke just a few moments ago. And uh, we have the 500 here, and I encourage every pastor here, every uh, teenager who likes to read, uh, if you like a riveting story, and you like a true life story that'll just absolutely, as we say, curl your hair. You got to get this book, the story of Mossab's life. It's unbelievable. Mossab, if I could uh, go back to our country a moment here, 
Um, at ground zero, 9-11, the Twin Towers come down. Uh, all this time we've taken rebuilding. It should have been rebuilt six, seven years ago. But we have uh, played this political game. Now, those of us who are reading the news understand that there's going to be an Islamic mosque built right there by ground zero. What, what's your thoughts about this with uh, the Islamic terrorists bringing down these towers and now we're building a mosque to honor that religion your thoughts please yes uh, this is really uh, very insulting i wrote about it a blog and you guys you can visit my blog at sonofhamas.com and uh, follow up with a story what i have sonofhamas.com yeah like like the Get book that, like the title yes. of the book and uh, in fact, uh, I'm going to New York tomorrow and we will be talking uh, more about this. Um, this will show you the real face of Islam. They came, they killed 3,000 innocent people who were in their offices that morning. That people want to forget now and everybody, including the government, wants everybody to forget, which is a good thing. To forgive, to move on, but not to forget that the enemy still exists on our soil and to come after that and say Islam is a religion of peace and we want to build this uh, cultural center you know mosque and uh, it's interfaith center this is a big lie they are insulting the victims and their families they are coming to the cemetery where people died. They had nothing to do with the name of the God of Islam. Those terrorists, if you go to everywhere on the internet and you see their statements, it was full of verses of the Quran that inspired them, motivated them. Their God mandates killing. They came to kill Americans to worship their God. And now, those moderate Muslims, that they wear nice suits and they in invest millions of dollars, they're here to come and make like a, a makeup for Islam, for its ugly face. And tell Americans, no, 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 we're not re religion of killing, we're religion of peace. We're not religion, religion of war. No, you are. Your religion is a religion of war. And you have to be honest about it. And but what really bothers me that they are being aggressive now. They come to the cemetery, people didn't forget. They didn't even build the tower again. It's still empty. Witnessing, crying out loud to, remember, to remind everybody what happened there, yes. to come and put a mosque to praise who? To praise who? To worship five times a day who? The God who mandated the killing of those innocent people just next door. You have a way of putting it right down where we say the rubber meets the road. I so, like that. Like, it, this is the reality of it and this is the truth. This is politically incorrect. This is why media doesn't like me. They don't like to talk to me because I say it the way it is. And they don't like me and I say, I'm not going to change. We like you here. You. Now, what I, tell, what I tell those uh, Muslim uh, moderate fools, excuse my language, that take your hundred million dollars that you want to build this 13-story building and go with it to Afghanistan and educate your people, build his hospitals. You know, America doesn't need your money and America doesn't need your culture of death. Take it back and to the poor people that you have. I, I cannot understand why they want, want to invest millions of dollars in this rock of division and insultation. Doesn't make any sense to me. And by the way, they come and say they talk about liberty. And uh, of course, liberals and uh, smart people in this country, they say, yes, you know, it's like we build churches, it's built like a mosque, you know, that's fine. It doesn't, it's not bothering them. But I tell those uh, uh, guys, no, it's, the, the system of Islam doesn't respect liberty that you're talking about. That's right. 
it doesn't coexist with liberty. It wants to destroy liberty. So when liberty has enough space for a religion like Islam, always we need to protect liberty with the Constitution. Yes. And the Constitution is very clear about radical, fundamentalist ideology like the ideology of Islam. And I think today they give them, I think, the permission to build the mosque there. And this is the time. If they are talking about liberty, if they want to build their mosque under the umbrella of liberty, we tell them, okay, that's fine. You built your mosque, but we have the right also under the umbrella of li liberty to say the truth about Islam. And don't be insulted. If we will make a movie about your prophet to show the entire world the real face of Islam based on your books, based on your Quran, don't come and say, you are insulting us because you are insulting the entire world. When you allow, when they allow, when they allow that we go and open a branch of this church right in the heart of Mecca. There you go. There you go. We, re we reconsider. Mosab, you said you were not a preacher. I think that's pretty good preaching. I like that. Let me ask you a couple more questions here. To those of us in America, we hear the news, and of course, it uh, seems like everywhere we look or every place we hear, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Uh, it's almost frightening for those of us a little older looking at a young generation. I almost, from the news, I want to look at the younger generation and say, you might be living in an Islamic state in this country in another 70 years or 60 years. Europe talks about how uh, Germany mentioned will 30 years will be an Islamic Republic. France is having trouble with the, the huge number of uh, the growth rate of Islam. How, how do you see the future of Islam and, and relative to Christianity? Yes, first of all, let me tell you that f fear not. Fear not, brother. Um, the devil looks and sounds strong sometimes, but I tell you, he's not. Amen. He's weak. Amen. And I know that you believe in this. I know that you believe in that, and we all believe in this. But I mean in the Islam as, as, a, as a religion. Yes, it's growing. Big deal. But it's empty. It has nothing to offer humanity. And uh, Islam maintained itself and protected itself for 1,400 years and more by fear, intimidation, and isolation. And I tell you, this is over. One of the reasons I came public with this, I could keep my faith, you know, and have peace in my life and just go to the church like everyone else when I moved to the United States and close all the chapters of my life. But I choose to go public to encourage others to come public and not to be afraid. Second, to send a message to my family and to the Muslims that they are going nowhere because they know that I didn't come from any Muslim family. I know about the Islamic project more than any Muslim knows about. In fact, I sacrificed for it more than most Muslims do. And I know what I'm talking about. I studied Islam, and I still study in it. And every time I study it, I know that this is totally from the devil. The powers of darkness control this religion. And this is not a religion versus religion, by the way. It's not, this is not Christianity versus Islam. This is the God who loves and the God who hates war. And I tell you, it might look for us very difficult to defeat this type of God, but we eventually will defeat him. And uh, uh, those are some of, the, uh, some of the logical reasons for people who uh, like uh, to be encouraged. Uh, we have uh, thousands of people coming to Christ, for example, on a daily basis in the Middle East. By phone calls, they accept Christ, they, you know, and we have... We have secret underground groups in every Arab Muslim country. We have a group of disciples that they study the Bible in Mecca, in the Kaaba. And I, I tell you that this is 
for real. We tell them, they say, the safest place for us to meet in Mecca, in the Kaaba. The most, the holiest place for Muslims. We tell them, why? They say, if we go and meet anywhere else, like an apartment, they will start to question. And we just go to their mosque, you know, wearing their traditional clothes, and we sit down, and the only thing that we're talking about, the Bible and Jesus Christ, and how we're going to change our society, and we never get suspicious. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. It's great. Do Muslims, do Muslims know this? They don't know that. They don't know this, but they see the change. Today with technology, you know that we can outreach everybody. We have here uh, uh, our brother, you know, with the... Uh, brother Greg, George Zeres. Craig, you know, with the radio stations. Radio stations. We have satellite TVs. Uh, also good news for Muslims. Uh, my publisher uh, decided to publish uh, Son of Hamas, my book, uh, for free for the Arab world to download. And that comes out when, you said? It starts a week from now. One week from now, it comes out free to the Arab yeah. world. For example, for example, my book, probably they wouldn't allow publishing it on any Arab Muslim soil. So we say, OK, uh, we will find a way around. So let's build a website and uh, have the electronic book there. And we tell Muslims, download it for free. We don't have even to publish it. So millions will get the chance to read it and go through this experience. This doesn't mean that we can change the Middle East in one night, in one day. And it's not only about my story. There are many other stories. Maybe I got more attention than others. But there are real heroes that nobody knows about. They're working very hard in the shadows. Yes. And they're working for the glory of the Lord. Uh, they are great soldiers. And we have Amen. thousands of those people who are working today in the Middle East. And they're... There, we are going to change the Middle East. So it, it, does, it doesn't matter. Let, let Muslims be very proud of some conversion here and there, but we will stop them. We will stop them. My, and my, I, my. I think it's not going to take more than a few years for the change to happen. Wow. Wow. That should give great hope. Masab. <laughs> This auditorium seats 7,500 people. You have thousands and thousands of teenagers before you. They come from all across America, Mexico, Canada, and other parts of the world. We have them from China here. We have them from Africa. What's your message to these young people in their teen years? What's your message to them in America and uh, these other parts of the world? What would you tell them today? First of all, I would like to say that I'm glad that none of you in a situation similar to my situation where I grew up. And please to be grateful uh, for the things that you have now. And when you look at the world, please to have a universal vision. Not only a local vision for you know, what we do next day or next year in our town or in our city, how we see the world. Do we know enough about the conflict in the Middle East? Do we know enough why terrorists are attacking us? Do we know, know enough about the ideology of Islam to educate ourselves and to be productive? Not only put ourselves in a religious box. Yes, reading the Bible is priority number one, believing our Lord, but also to be productive. Some of us are the best doctors. Some of us, of, of us are the best teachers. Some of us best mothers best fathers, to be the best example in every field, in every field, and give an example of what we can do as a body of Christ outside of the box of religion. Yes, you, I don't encourage anybody to break the law, but sometimes if we do, and none of us is perfect, we need to understand that we're living on His grace. Amen. And He covered us with His blood. This doesn't mean that we become totally loose. Um, because we have to be strong. As you see, the enemy is very dangerous and he's trying to destroy us. I want you, uh, of course, to have lots of fun and to enjoy life um, and uh, to enjoy the liberty in this country. This is a great thing without, and to understand also the importance of the free will that God gave us from day one as human uh, beings. And um, 
to look all, always in a good way toward the others. You know, all humans are uh, God's children. And he cries for their situation every day, on a daily basis. And we need to see everybody like this without, without just going and forcing Jesus Christ on them. Here is the Bible, you've got to read it. And if they don't accept that, you know, we turn our back and we uh, hate them maybe. Um, as, as you see, uh, it took me six years to recognize Jesus Christ as my Lord. And some people, maybe your neighbor, will take him 10 years, maybe 20 years, maybe forever. Uh, we have to love everybody unconditionally and uh, uh, forgive people who uh, do bad uh, to us. That's a great story. Great, great, marvelous story. Is it, what can we do for you? What can, uh, what can we as American Christians here, what can we do for Mossab? Uh, the most important thing that really satisfies me is to see the change and the uh, level of awareness of the nature of our enemy. Um, I want you at least, you know, to support what I'm saying. You know, I, I personally don't accept donations. <laughs> and uh, I don't want money to get involved in this. Uh, but a real support will be to trust what I'm saying. You don't have to believe in everything that I said, and you have all the right to question it. But please question it. Please think about it. And when I see the change happening, I will be happy at that, at that moment. Today, I'm still in a war, and I'm, fi I'm fighting a big fight, uh, as I told you, against almost everybody. And not because I hate people, you know, I'm talking about love, and I need to just be careful how I do it without hurting anybody, but I have to say the truth the way, the way it is. I would wish that uh, your youth groups, youth director, pastor, if you would uh, lead your youth group to pray for this man. Uh, if you're a thinking person, you can only imagine how Hamas and uh, Palestinians, but in a general sense, those who strongly believe in the Islamic faith, they're, they're frightened of this man, and they would love to eliminate him. They would love to rid him. His voice is strong, it's powerful, his testimony is unimpeachable, and his faith in Christ is strong. And uh, let's pray for our brother here that uh, you, you... Excuse me. Can, please. can, can I add one more thing would. before we pray, please? Please. I, I, please don't focus on me. You know, if I share with you some of my personal life, probably you will stop believing in me right now. <laughs> I want you please to focus on the Lord. You know, he's our highest example. I am not a hero. I'm ignorant. Nothing. Uh, stupid person that the Lord used. This is how I see myself. And please to keep all your focus on the Lord always because people will disappoint you. I might disappoint you. I, I hope not, but I might disappoint you. So please to keep all the focus on the Lord, not on man.